everyone, and welcome to Living One. Uh, my name is Olivia Crossman, and I am your host. Living One is a monthly webinar series in which presenters from around the world share their vision for a future in which we Earth, all Earth beings live as one community in peace, dignity, and freedom. We ask the question, we know what's wrong, <clears throat> but what does right look like? This fall marks the beginning of Living One's fourth year, but today these conversations are more important than ever. For they are more than conversations. They are opportunities to build community, solve for the isolating wounds of our time. Today we have the third session of our special autumn series, Recognition, Reparation, and Restoration. Continuing over the next two weeks, three workers share their experiences and insights in reparative and restorative work that forges healing paths for Earth's renewal. Recognition and reparation are necessary steps to erase the footprint of raci racism and speciesism. Reparation and reinstatement of indigenous sovereignty are critical elements for spiritual and material renewal. We are delighted to have you join us as we explore this important topic together. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all currently on various different indigenous lands. I am currently on the ancestral homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, which includes the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. This land exists also as a place of trade with other indigenous communities, um, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meskwaki. The Krulo Center for Nonviolence, located in Southern Oregon, is also the homelands of the grizzly bear, Tacoma, and gray wolf. To recognize the land is to recognize the lasting effects of colonization, genocide, and oppression that still impact indigenous communities today. But it is also an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the land and all for and for all those whose homelands we live and work on. In the third of this six-part series, we welcome Joseph Daniel Mitchell and Mary Beth Timothy. In conversation with Carulos director Gabe Bradshaw, Joe and Mary Beth will speak on land back, tribal and wildlife sovereignty. Joseph Daniel Mitchell, MS, is a full blood citizen of the Creek Nation and a member of the Mus Muscogee Indian community. In addition to being a senior executive fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, Joe has consulted with tribal governments and communities in the US on <clears throat> Indian law and served as a tribal advocate for exercising treaty rights on federal lands and implementing traditional practices for four decades. He has worked in, in environmental sciences and conservation on tribal and federal lands with more than 200 tribes, the USDA Forest Service, Washington DC, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Mary Beth Timothy is a native Oklahoman who is pursuing her, dream, pursuing her dreams of creating art and working towards making it accessible to all walks of life. She is an enrolled Cherokee Nation and works as a full-time artist, illustrator, and business owner. Mary Beth is a self-taught multimedia artist who overall features an array of subjects and themes in her art, although she leans towards her love of wildlife. Through her work, she shares her affinity for Oklahoma wild birds, animals, and wildflowers. Mary Beth chooses to create what she feels and loves to tell stories through her work. Her goal is to touch the ones that view it and cause a reaction, whether it be emotional or even a stirring curiosity. Both stimulate conversation about the piece and provide her the opportunity to tell its story. Mary Beth has traveled and participated in art shows and other venues all around the country and in Europe. Before we begin, let me share a few logistical notes. Joe and Mary Beth will be speaking for about 45 minutes, after which we will open a question and answers period when you're invited to type your questions into the chat, which we will read after the presentation. Also, please note that this Zoom session will be recorded. So if you would feel more comfortable leaving your camera off or changing your Zoom name, please feel free to do so. So without further ado, we welcome Joseph Daniel Mitchell, Mary Beth Timothy, and Dr. Gabe Bradshaw. Hello, everyone. It's all wonderful to be here. And I hope a lot of people are enjoying that extra hour in the morning with our new time change. <clears throat> Uh, it's great. I get to see Mary Beth and Joe, who are very dear to me and have done such amazing work. We'll just start off. Um, we're lucky that they're both in the same room. Um, but Joe, do you want to start off and kind of maybe ground the listeners and viewers uh, about where you grew up and the Muskogee? 
the history yeah. and the natural history as well. I know it's like a big talk it for five minutes, but <laughs> I, uh, well, yes, I uh, I'm a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, the, I grew up here. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I am a full blood uh, member of the Creek Nation, and uh, I've lived here. I grew up here, and uh, after college, moved away. But at, after retirement. Uh, I wanted to come back and be in the same area as my tribe. And so uh, it's hard to get away from some place where uh, your, all of your tribal members are. So I'm really glad to be back home. But uh, the Creek Nation is part of uh, the five civilized tribes. And the five civilized tribes are made up of the Muscogee Creek, the Cherokees, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, and the Seminoles, and uh, they were some of the tribes that were moved from the southeastern part of the U.S. into Indian Territory, which is now Oklahoma. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if you want me to talk about Indian removal right now, or, or <clears throat> should I get to that later day whatever you would oh, like whatever you like whatever whatever comes up oh. well let me let me just uh just start off by giving you a little bit of uh general information about tribes <clears throat> and uh originally there were about 90 million indians uh in what is now the u.s uh, uh, and uh these 90 million Indians spoke probably 300 different tribal languages. Now, many of those languages have been lost now, and there's a big movement to bring these languages back or to uh, at least preserve the languages that we ha have. Um, there are 347 federally recognized tribes in the lower 48 states and 227 in Alaska. And the Alaskans, the Alaska tribes are, call themselves uh, native Alaskans. A federally recognized tribe is defined as a uh, body of people bound together by blood, society, politics, religion, and culture, living together in a definite territory and speaking a common, common language or dialect. <clears throat> now, federally, rec federally recognized tribes <clears throat> are those that are supported in some way by the federal government. And they, we have a number of, of tribes that uh, have not met this criteria. And so they are not federally recognized. And what that means is and if they're not federally recognized and they do not receive support from the federal government. Uh, <clears throat> most of these tribes have treaties with the, uh, with the federal government, US government, and uh, they can be verified by, their, by this def particular definition. Now, <clears throat> 347 right now, <clears throat> federally recognized tribes, that number changes every year because there are a number of uh, tribal bodies that claim to be federally recognized or, or claim that they will be federally recognized because they fit the criteria, but they have to apply for this recognition. So that number, 347 uh changes every year because other tribes have applied for federal recognition. Yeah. I'm not really sure uh, the title of this presentation is Recognition, Reparation, and Restoration. And that uh, applies to the land that uh, the tribes owned before colonization. And uh, I think Gay wanted me to talk a little bit about uh, 
about this land issue and what is essentially happening today with Indian tribes and their efforts to recover some of this land. <clears throat> I'm sure you all know that, uh, that tribes owned the entire continent uh, at one time, but slowly the land was taken away from them in some way or other, usually by treaty. And uh, essentially a treaty is a, an exchange. In other words, you give me something and I'll give you something. That's essentially what a treaty is. And we all know what the tribes gave. They gave their land and the U.S. government gave promises. We promise to take care of you. If you give us your land, we'll take care of you. And uh, Andrew Jackson was president at the time that the removal era began. Uh, he was pretty much responsible for removing all, all many of the tribes from the southeast and the northeast part of the country into what is now Oklahoma, which was then called Indian Territory. So let me give you a, a few dates. Andrew Jackson was uh, president from 1829 to 1837. I'm not a historian, but uh, 1829 to 1937. Uh, I'm not a historian, but uh, this is uh, what I've gotten from uh, from the textbooks. The uh, removal period lasted about 10 years from 1830 to 1840. And that all came about because of, a, uh, of an act, a bill that was passed that gave Andrew Jackson the authority to begin negotiations with tribes. And the negotiations essentially were negotiations to trade land. Andrew Jackson wanted the land in the southeastern U.S. and uh, in return, he would exchange those lands in Indian territory for the southeastern portion of the United States. But the Indian Removal Act essentially gave, just gave him the ability to negotiate. It didn't give him any other authority, just, but just to negotiate treaties. During that period, that 10 year period, approximately several, 70 treaties were signed between the US government and tribal nations, all exchanging lands with, uh, with the US. This period, 10 year period that moved tribes from Southeastern, the southeastern U.S. and into Indian Territory became known as the Trail of Tears because many of the tribes, some of the tribes did not want to, to be moved and they resisted. So the government forcibly removed them and the trail that they traveled became known as the Trail of Tears. It's pretty much recognized as being the Cherokee Trail of Tears, but it's not the only tribe that traveled that trail. There were five other tribes, the, Musco the five civilized tribes that were moved along those, this trail, Trail of Tears. So uh, the Trail of Tears was the tribe, was, was a trail that, uh, many tribes traveled, not just the Cherokee Nation, although they're probably mostly associated with that. Uh, is there anything, Gay, is there anything more that you would like for me to say about that? I, I know that we talked about a, a list of things that you might might want me to recover, uh, to cover. Uh, 
Well, I think, you know, I think what you, you mentioned, the the land back and maybe maybe um, segue into that. I wanted to just make a quick comment just on something earlier. You know, when you were talking about all the languages, um, you know, for example, here, the, something that really strikes me is that just this is so we were in the Applegate Valley in, in southern Oregon. And uh, a lot of this history is being pieced together. But what's really ex what I think is really extraordinary, it's very much like Switzerland, where or northern Italy, where you have very dissected terrain. And so you'll have just like one valley speaks a almost not, you know, unintelligible language with this one, or you know what I mean? They, they're, they're not just dialects, they're they really, they're very distinct languages. And you find that here, even though we're not that mountainous. And I think that what really struck me when you were talking about the diversity of languages, um, which is probably far less than the actual, you know, pre-conquest numbers of languages, is that here, which is fairly small, we have like three or four known different tribes that have very distinct languages. So what that really brought up when you said that was the tie to the land. And you know what I'm trying to say? In other words, there's almost a gravitational pull of, of tribes, tribal people to the land. And that kind of gravitational pull, in a sense, um, brings about this diversity and in, in, it's reflected in the diversity of language. Well, yes, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I guess generally uh, when people talk about Indian tribes, uh, they kind of lump them all together. But uh, uh, all tribes are different. They're, they're not the same at all. They may look the same. And to us, they don't look the same, uh, but uh, they are different. They uh, Their cultures are different. They practice different cultures. Their languages are different. In some cases, they can understand each other, but uh, mostly they cannot because their languages are all different. They're not the same. And uh, uh, this is something that the tribes are trying to recover. They have lost many of their languages and that's uh the language is something that that holds our culture together so it's very important to tribes today and there there's a large uh, national movement for all tribes to bring their languages back because we have very few uh, speakers now that know the language uh, as it used to be so that's very important to tribes now uh, and that's a tied into to the to the space and the land and, and the ancestry, the, which is leads us into the land back movement. Maybe you could just say a little bit about that and how that relates. And and actually what I was just also thinking while you were saying it is is these this sort of move, you know, movement which is really flourishing now and finally being able to be heard and recognized. Um, so many aspects of tribal people, we'll just use that generic term right now. Uh, is so antithetical to the non-indigenous culture. You know, the for example, the the structures, the processes of governance, um, the homogeneity. You know, everyone speaks English. I mean, in this country, we'll say this in the United States, and it's very antithetical to a lot of the tribal cultures, which there's specificity. You know, there's diversity. There's incredible tie to land, etc. And I think that's also really what defines the land back movement in many ways. You, uh, yes, you wanted me to talk a little bit about uh, about uh, the relationship between tribes and nature and wildlife. <clears throat> and so uh, I will mention that a little bit. Uh, tribes originally really had a, a uh, relationship with wildlife and nature that was unbreakable. Uh, they thought about this was all seen as a whole. In other words, you could not separate the tribes from the wildlife or from nature. They were all one together. Now, one of the, uh, one of the uh, goals of the U.S. government when they began removing tribes uh, onto reservations was to break this particular connection. And uh, they tried very hard to break the culture of Indian tribes. As a matter of fact, there was a saying during that period of time that we want to try and kill the Indian, but save the man. 
and that just meant that they wanted to to uh, assimilate uh, Indian tribes. In other words, they wanted to remove their culture and bring them into a new culture and turn Indians into essentially white people. That was the goal of the federal government. And uh, a lot of this began with the treaty. The treaties were probably, there were so many made, but they probably were the biggest uh, failure as far as Indian tribes losing their culture and their land. Uh, this treaties were probably responsible more than anything else. And because they took the land, right, the latest figure I've, I've seen was somewhere around 100 million acres is how much land the federal government holds in trust for tribes now. Whenever, whenever reservations were formed, the government took the land in trust and said, we will hold this land for you and we will uh, take care of, of the land for you. So much of this land is now in trust, somewhere around 100 million acres. Uh, again, that these figures change every year, but uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a very small amount compared to the entire United States. <clears throat> and so that gives you some idea of how much land was taken from the tribes. Uh, the treaty, the treaty era was designed to break the Indian and uh, break, break up the Indian culture and uh, take their land and place Indians in a particular position where they can no longer practice their culture and assimilate into uh, U, uh, U.S. culture, I guess. <clears throat> um, the first tribe, the first treaty was in 1778, and that was with the Delaware tribe in the northeastern part of the U.S. And that treaty was essentially a treaty to ensure that the Delaware tribe would become one of the allies of the 13 states. This was during the Revolutionary War. And uh, the, uh, the US wanted tribes on their side. They wanted to make the tribes an ally. So that was the first treaty. <clears throat> that was the purpose of the first treaty. Um, slowly, that purpose changed to the removal period where it was a a treaty for land, and uh, that era probably destroyed, did more damage to destroy the culture of Indian than anything else. Um, today, there is a movement to buy back land from from anyone, anyone that they can, in order to uh, to try and recover much of the land that was taken from them. Uh, the treaties were broken often because of gold. Gold was discovered in certain areas, and the next thing you knew, these treaties were broken by the by the U.S. government. Uh, they would give give the tribe land, and then they would take it back, and give it to them, and take it back. And most of the times, when they took the land back, it was taken back illegally. They never were compensated for this. And most recently, a uh, person sued the federal government for an accounting of all the land that they that the U.S. government holds in trust. In other words, the uh, the government holds 100 million acres of land in trust for tribes and tribal members. They also control the resources and the mineral rights that uh, these lands hold. The government was supposed to 
handle all of the finances that the tribes received from leasing these mineral rights or grazing rights, land rights, and the government would accept the, uh, the receipts from those leases, and then they would distribute them to the tribes. Well, about 25 years ago, 20 or 25 years ago, someone said, we need an accounting from the government of all of these land leases. And so they sued the government and won. And the result of this lawsuit was that the government had to compensate for much of the uh, of the finances that the tribes or tribal members never received from the government because of mismanagement. And this led to what is now known as a buyback program. Uh, in the settlement, in the land settlement, the government agreed to, to help buy back some of the land on behalf of the tribes that had been that had been fractionated. In other words, uh, the, if a if an Indian person owned 160 acres of land, this was held in trust for the government, and that person had heirs, and that land was divided many times up amongst those heirs, and before you knew it, that 160 acres became one tenth or one one hundredth or one one thousandth, and that 160 acres was now divided amongst a thousand people. And so the government initiated a buyback program for those that wanted to sell that their fraction of that land in order to try and uh, reconsolidate that that property. But uh, this was a uh, the buyback program was something started by the federal government as a result of that lawsuit. But tribes themselves now have started their own buyback program. And they are attempting to buy back as much land as they can whenever it becomes available, whether it's private land or any other type of land. They want to grow their land base again like they used to have. So that particular buyback program essentially was uh, an idea that began whenever tribes began to acquire money and that was all acquired by casinos when casino the casino period began tribes began to have money now they have lots of money and so they have the ability to buy back a lot of this land and that's what they are attempting to do so i think that's what i think that's what you wanted me to to explain Gabe. yeah that, it's, it's terrific background on that and I was I was thinking that really that that wildlife uh, revitalization conservation that we would call it or sovereignty is inextricably linked with that of of tribal people. That's right. I mean, it, because it, it you know to put it this way, in other words, that the wild like for example, that many of the I think Muskogee you have bear the bear clan and yes bear clan. So a lot of the I, I don't know identity and meaning is tied up with with the wildlife with particular right. wildlife so right. for example like bear i wasn't sure if it was grizzly or, there was a i was listening to a, um, an old talk of vine deloria's vines um and he you know he's a historian or he was a historian and you know he had he goes through all of the all the documents and there was all these descriptions of in the plains of grizzly bears like some explorer seeing 200 bears big bears you know and you know and he was saying well it's no surprise if you look at the names they're all their standing bear you know the little bear big bear and so anyway that's a language thing again so really your the land back is really rooted or it's synonymous with wildlife land back in a sense that's right and with uh with the acquisition of more land, then the tribes are also, uh, they have a large movement now to uh, restore the buffalo, uh, herds of buffalo that were also lost. Now many tribes have uh, herds of buffalo uh, with the land that they are 
are uh, buying back, they're also restoring buffalo herds. They're also restoring corridors for wildlife to travel from one area to another or one state to another. Many of the tribes now have begun uh, corridor programs for wildlife, state to state, from Colorado to, uh, let's say, uh, Utah, where animals used to migrate across these areas. Now tribes are trying to bring that back again with their corridor progression, or pro program rather, uh, migratory routes for wildlife are also being established. And this is all, this is all, it's not the, all the result of, uh, of casino money, but it certainly helps to have, uh, to have incomes where before. Leverage, uh, yeah. <laughs> before they, they had uh, uh, no way of uh, acquiring any finances. There were just no industry on reservations. Yeah. So uh, everything, everything that uh, has occurred with tribes is related to land. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the, the, the climate change is, I mean, obviously that's, you know, you and I always talk about the weather and everything. I mean, it's obviously very core and it's having a big impact um, on the animals and people and humans. But do you think in some ways that there's a side of it that because it's um, really forcing dramatic adaptation and change, um, in the quote unquote white culture. Do you think in some ways though, that that is also kind of helping the shift into uh, tribal lands and tribal cultures? I think so. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yes, I think so. I think global global warming uh, is really is having a, a definite effect on this. And uh, uh, you just cannot, uh, you cannot operate the way you used to because the climate has changed. And so uh, this, yes, this definitely has a big effect on that. So there is a kind of a silver lining, although it is, it, you know, it is affecting so many people and, and animals. It's still, there's kind of a, it's, I think it's creating an opening. That's what it feels like to me, that there's sort of an opening and a, a pause <laughs> for disabling and disconnecting from this um, very destructive culture that we've been sort of held hostage to. Yeah, I yes, I think so too. I agree with you. Yeah. Is there anything else that you I, I don't want to take up uh, Mary Beth's time. So Well uh, <laughs> Well, I I know you're gonna have questions and I won't I won't monopolize you, but um thank you and there'll be more conversation afterward. Mary Beth, would you like to step in and push Joe over? <laughs> I was I was enjoying listening to all I know. Well don't stop. Joe doesn't stop talking. <laughs> this is more of a conversation. Right. Right. Um, so now I don't know how to follow that. Well, I'm an artist. My head's full of pretty colors. But I have <laughs> well, you know, just just for you know the the listeners and myself, say a little bit about because Joe talked about Muskogee and then the, you know the differences in the tribes and things like that. Can you say a little bit about your Cherokee, you know, background and experience and and culture? And, and then lead that into your art because I'm I actually while Joe was talking, Joe was looking over your shoulder at that. Is is that a heron or a? There's a beautiful um, oh, picture behind me. The white egret. Oh, it's an egret. Okay, yeah, yes. beautiful. Yes, thank you. And then, of course, you see this wolf with the glasses. I I'm doing um, a project right now for Indian Health Services in Oklahoma City. They're um, putting different images in different parts of their. Um, medical offices and so I have some that are going into the optometry <laughs> office so that's what that's for <laughs> so everybody that's terrific there. Joe and I were talking about that new hospital wasn't it Joe you were saying there was a new Cherokee hospital oh that's yeah that's in Tahlequah and it's beautiful and it and it's actually full of um, beautiful Cherokee art as well so yes we're right we're neighbors um right now we're in or on the Muskogee Reservation and where our house is. And we're right pretty close to the line with Cherokee Nation. So my husband, John, is Muskogee Creek, like Joe, and I am Cherokee. Um, my family is or was from North Carolina, came over. Um, most of mine came over before the Trail of Tears, um, 
I had a great, great, one of my greats grandfathers was a lawyer that helped set up the Koala Boundary in North Carolina. Um, a lot of people call it the Cherokee Reservation in Cherokee, but it's actually a boundary that is set up there. And anyway, so they came over and their land allotments were all in northeastern Oklahoma, um, around Ulaga and Pryor, um, Spavanaugh, places like that. So, um, yeah, my family has pretty much all stayed in that area, except my mom was in the army and then got married, um, to my step, she got married early and had me got divorced, married a Yankee man from upstate New York. And so we've moved around quite a bit. And I actually didn't come back to this area until I got a divorce from my first husband. So I was not raised around my culture. Um, there was a lot of feeling disconnected and feeling like I didn't fit in and there was something missing. Um, I don't really know how to describe that feeling until one, I became an artist and two came back to Indian country and started connecting with other native artists and native peoples. And then it was like, Oh, oh, Okay, here, here it is. This is what I was looking for. This is what was missing. And now I, I'm here. Here it is. So, um, so yeah, I, another thing I grew up being known as like a tomboy, I guess I wasn't a girly girl, always had to be outside in the dirt and digging around making mud pies, climbing trees, looking at bugs, collecting bugs and frogs and driving my parents crazy. And they got me in rocks, always rocks. And my parents got me a microscope when I was about seven or eight. And so everything I was having to look, I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was little. And that's something not very many people know. <laughs> but, you know, so there was that that connection to the land with me always having to be outside always. And I still love that. And every chance I get, I'm outside digging around in the dirt. Well, you're kind of an archeologist, like you said, with the layers that you've, you know, from your own, your own childhood and coming back and. Right. Right. A psychological archeologist maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but just connecting. Um, like I said, whenever I came back here and started connecting with family again and meeting so many other natives and you know and a lot and I'm not full blood of course um my birth father I don't know they're from Tennessee so um I did find a first cousin that you know they they aren't sure they have a really dark side of the family that is some kind of native but they don't know what it was um, one of those type things. Um, but my mom's side is Cherokee and um, English. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I have, I have that thing. My husband says I'm a chameleon. I can fit into whichever scene I go into, you know, I can go into the white community and fit in with them. I can go into the native community and fit in with them. So I, I have a little bit of a balance there, but but I think if I hadn't have come back and connected with this side, I, there would have been something off, you know, for, for me the rest of my life. I don't, I don't think it would have been, you know, I mean, I just would have been unsettled. So. Those things are hard to describe, you know, as they say that the ineffable can't be put into words. So maybe that's where your art comes in is, is speaking things that can't be said in words. Yes. And I've learned so much, you know, coming back, it's, it's like, I've, I've been like a sponge trying to learn as much as I can about our heritage and, and, and the history part. And I loved, you know, listening to Joe there. And, and there were some things that I didn't know that, that I heard him talking about. So, you know, taking, 
language workshops, things like that. You know, we were talking about bringing the language back. I know, and I've seen with my husband talking about the Creek Nation having their language classes as well, but I know Cherokee Nation has a lot of, especially within our 14 counties that are in the Cherokee Nation, now Cherokee Reservation, um, that they have lots of language classes in each community. They are also, um, they have been working on a huge language center, I guess, that's in Tahlequah, which is where Cherokee Nation is. And that is going to be a a huge, huge thing for Cherokee Nation. Um, They've got a lot of their their fluent speakers that are involved. And we've got immersion classes where the children go in and all they hear all day long is Cherokee. And I just think that is so great. But, you know, it's like what I told them, though, you know, that's fine. But then when they go home, they need to have that at home, too. So and and they're realizing that and they're, you know, they're trying to to pull that all together. And I think that, that having that center is going to be a a big, big help in that. You think there's been a change or Joe, maybe you can also say, too, that um, is there been a shift that you think within the communities of people now wanting, you know, to, to, to have their children learn the language and things like that, as opposed to hiding it, you know, I mean, I guess there was, I mean, I know that was the case is, you know, there was such a history of being punished for using language. And so they're at least, you know, Joe, you probably remember, you know, this, the, that, that atmosphere and that actual reality of not being able to honor the culture, participate and speak. So there really seems to be something fundamental shift now. And it wasn't just the, it wasn't just being punished for saying it like in the schools either. I, I've talked to different people that said when they were growing up that their parents or grandparents wouldn't let them speak their language. I mean, they would hear the adults in the other room speaking the language, but they didn't want them to know it because they didn't want them to have to deal with that prejudice in school or out in public. So I think that's so sad. I hate that. And that yes, that's 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 really true. But Mary Beth is, is, is saying, uh, in my case, my parents spoke Creek, the Creek language fluently, but they would not teach it to myself and my brothers because they wanted us to learn English. And so uh, I grew up knowing s- certain things of the language, but uh, uh, not being able to speak it fluently like they did. So it was because they wanted us to learn English because they knew that we were in order to get by in this world, we needed to, to learn English and get an education. So, but now uh, what you were saying, Gay, is that uh, as far as bringing the language back, uh, it's no longer shameful for anyone to speak their Indian language. As a matter of fact, there is a college uh, in Tahlequah, <clears throat> not far from here, that uh, where the Cherokee Nation is located, there is a state college and they teach the Cherokee language at that college. Now you can actually go there and take classes and uh, learn Cherokee. They teach it at OU too. OU, Oklahoma University, that's right. Mm-hmm. Many of the colleges now are beginning to teach the Indian language. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that, this is kind of a personal question, Joe, but um, do you feel like that barrier, in other words, that you weren't allowed to, to learn Muscogee Creek, um, do you feel like that kind of was somehow disconnected you in a, in a way from your parents and grandparents? I think it did. I think it did. I, uh, I regret now that uh, I wasn't able to learn that language, but uh, uh, we have classes now. So, uh, and I take classes in the Creek language, but uh, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had been able to learn it when I was young. Because these Indian languages, they're very difficult to learn. They're, they're very difficult to pronounce. Yeah, very difficult to <laughs> pronounce and, and to write. And I think it it's not funny, but I, I worked at the Five Civilized Tribes Museum here in Muskogee for about 10 years. And 
people would come in and, and bless their hearts, they wanted to learn the language and they would buy workbooks and things like that, that we might carry. And you can't really learn the language just by reading it in a workbook. There's so many guttural and nasal and, you know, different ways of pronouncing, you know, where you put the emphasis and it, you can tell when somebody would come in from learning from a workbook, you could tell immediately that that's where they had learned it and not, you know, as a speaker or from a speaker. Well, it's, it's, again, it just underscores the whole idea of the, of bringing back the wholeness, you know, of the land and the language and the culture, because, you know, why, why learn a language if you're by yourself, right? You know, it, it's really revitalizing relationships and everything and psyche and, and the community and, and, and the meaning that comes from that. So Mary Beth, I, I want to make sure that we, you, continue on your discussion of your art can you talk about that enough if you want to show some of your art and maybe kind of lead us through that okay okay so um one of our well well my mouse disappeared um one of the Cherokee origin stories talks about that we came from an island um, in the south somewhere and that there was a huge volcano on it. But for many, many, many years that we flourished and and that a, a lot of tribes will say Turtle Island and um, one of the Cherokee stories um, also calls it Turtle Island. <clears throat> but then at some point this volcano starts to erupt and cause earthquakes and all of the people started loading their families onto these boats. And there were several boats that went out and they say that only seven of them arrived up in the North part, like around New York, up in the Northern part of the U S and lived with the Iroquois. And that's where they um, had developed this new language and the, the Cherokee language is an Iroquoian language and then settled in the around the Smoky Mountains, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And anyway, so in Tahlequah, they had taken the old Cherokee courthouse and um, turned it into a state of the art Cherokee National History Museum just within the last four or five years. And I was fortunate to be one of four Cherokee artists that created all of the interior artwork for that museum. And so one of the things that I wanted to put into this painting was, you know, just different symbolic things about our lives back there, our ancestors' lives, right? And so we've got the island in the center, and I know you probably can't see it, um, but there's little huts in the trees, and there's a little lake, and then we've got the volcano, of course, and the sea turtle. We also have different elements of things that either we have stories about or that are sacred to us or important to us in some kind of way. So I've included a crawdad in there. Um, To the left, we've got corn. And you can't see it really, but there's a little honeybee. We've got a dragonfly and the white water bird, white egret, um, some quahog shell, which they use to make wampum, um, the conch shell. And then to the right, you've got the tobacco plant. You've got grandmother spider there, um, a hummingbird, a monarch, butterfly or willela, and the eagle. So let me move to the next one. This this was a fun piece I just recently did. It was a commission for IHS or Indian Health Services in Oklahoma City. It's called Transition, and it shows native bison art from the beginning to now. So you've got the cave drawings or etches, and then it moves to ledger art that... Um, like natives that were imprisoned, locked up, they would draw on anything that they had. And so that's where that comes from. 
and we've got the flat style, bacon style art, and then um, contemporary abstract, and then more of the realism. So that was a fun one. Mary this Beth, is, can, you, uh, can you say, excuse me, can you, can you say a little bit more about ledger art? Ledger art. So when, like, they would take ledger paper and crayons and and draw on that and so now that's kind of a thing to where um different native artists if they can get a hold of any type of ledger paper then they they will create that um so it, it's kind of just become a style of art i don't, I don't know what else oh that's great thank you have you ever heard anything about that in there? yeah uh, yeah just uh what what Mary Beth has said it's the uh, the old ledger drawings have become very valuable now. Uh, it's something that very sought after because it was some of the first uh, uh, drawings that the Indians had done on paper. On paper, right? Yeah. Okay, and then this is just a few of of my wildlife pieces: the wolves and foxes, and. Some of my songbirds. I have a. So a the wolves, the wolves uh, Mary Beth and Joe, the, the, the uh, gray wolves uh, um, were originally in your area. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah. We also, there's um, stories about Cherokee and, and red wolves also. And I, I don't know if there were any in Oklahoma, but um, maybe North Carolina. I'm not sure. I haven't heard all the stories about that, but I know that they have a new documentary that they're doing about the Cherokee's connection with the Red Wolf um, because I put in for one of their projects um, on learning that because they were talking about how that they were so connected with them that they would hunt with them and they were part of their everyday life too. So, which is pretty interesting. So, um, but these are some of the songbirds. I love, love, love birds, as you can tell. And then a few of my water birds and birds of prey. And then also the wildflowers. I did a little um, series of Oklahoma native wildflowers. I'm sure I'll do a lot more. But this was just a few I did um, in the last couple of years. And this is my most recent project. Um, I worked on it for two years with um, Cherokee author Chris Tuton. And this is a book that will be coming out in January called Cherokee Earth Dwellers. I have 66 illustrations in that book. It's going to be a big book. But what he did, we had um, one of our Cherokee National Treasures and Beloved Elders, Hastings Shade, had written books, had done so much with the language and um, just so many traditional things. And he had gathered up information um, since the early 70s until he passed away. And his widow, Loretta, and his son, Larry, decided they wanted it put into a book. And so they connected with Chris and then um, there were actually supposed to be three Cherokee artists that were working on it together when this first started a couple of years ago. And before we even signed contracts, one of the um, illustrators had to drop out because of work and, you know, different deadlines and things. And the other artist had so many he works with the language department and he also takes care of his parents and his dad passed away and so he had to drop out and so it ended up instead of doing like 15 illustrations like I said I ended up having to do 66 which Amazing. it was very um well it was very stressful <laughs> at the time <laughs> I mean, headlines and but, you know, what What was really stressful, but yet I'm grateful for was that I had to research so much in this project 
um, a lot of the botanicals that because the book is it's got Cherokee folklore, Cherokee history, Cherokee language, um, the importance of different um, wildlife, insects, plants, trees, native foods. You know, I mean, it's got everything in it. It's just cram packed full of information. So anything to do with the botanicals and the trees, things like that, I had to do major research because they wanted it like like you'll see on the blood root, the flower with the root system. They wanted it like that with the root system up to the top. And if it had anything else special, then they wanted it added on there, just like the tree up at the top. You'll see the the branch. That's our Osage orange or, or Bodark. Um so I had to research and find these things and common names. I couldn't use common names because, you know, you might call or several people might call um, 10 different plants the same name, you know. So I would have to go by the scientific name and do so much research to find how to do all of those. So that's why it took so long. But but these are just some different examples of illustrations that that are in that book and like I said it's coming out in January they just opened up the pre-orders for it and so I'm super super excited about this that's fantastic what is the on the on my left it's that circle like a, it's like a sundial what, what's that yeah, it's it's a chart that just shows the connection between the directions the the seasons the different animals and the clans um, those are the different, the seven clans of the Cherokee that you'll see there um, with the animals and the plants. So, well, this would be a fantastic, you know, book for yes. everyone. Yes. Because and it pulls everything up, together. I looked it up on the pre-order and I saw it said $34 and I was like, oh, that's expensive <laughs> to me. And then um, somebody said, no, that's the paperback. And I looked at it and the hardback <laughs> is $99. So it's a big book. It's yeah. Amazing. It has a lot of illustrations and wow, it must be amazing. Yeah. A lot of information in it. What a lovely thing for his family as well. Yeah. And unfortunately, and I, I met Hastings um, uh, quite a while back before he passed away and got to listen to him telling stories. And then, and I never thought I'd be connected to him forever through this. But when we started with this, we were supposed to have some online meetings with Loretta, his widow. And then right before um, we were supposed to start our meeting. She got sick and was never able to. And then she passed away. And so I have met his son, Larry. We had a meeting. Chris flew in. Chris, the author, actually lives in Seattle. And he flew in and we all had a meeting together. And it, it was really great. So I'm, I'm just really humbled and thrilled to be part of that project. Is Chris a Cherokee? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. It must be a incredible. You should feel very proud about it. It's really I beautiful. I <laughs> really. I and, and, it, you know, getting back to our, you know, kind of a theme is that really, this is a, this is a, a move of restoration, you know, bringing all these different animals to attention and, and showing the richness of the, of the Cherokee land. Yep. Yes, ma'am. And now you need to do a Muskogee one, right, Joe? Uh, well, I, I don't know about that. I, I will buy this book when it comes out. But... I, I think you just upped your sales, Mary Beth. Right. <laughs> I'll buy the hard copy. Oh, there you go. Last but not least. Right? Last but not least. Do you want me to read this out loud? So um, this piece, this is the sculpture that... Um, has, has long been long, long awaited, still awaited, um, that hopefully someday will come to fruition and will become 3D instead of 2D on here. But this is something that Gay and I have discussed and planned for several years now, um, a piece that will tie together the tribes and 
the loggerhead turtle. So I'll just read this out loud. This piece ties together the journey of the loggerhead and the five civilized tribes centered by the pole covered with ancient tribal symbols that were found in and around the burial mounds in the southeast part of the U.S., such as Moundville, Alabama, Chota, Georgia, Spiro, Oklahoma. The symbols vary from fertility to sun circles to death motifs, all different components of life centering this sculpture. The helix, which also symbolizes DNA, intertwines both the turtle and human tracks, recreating their long journeys. On one side of each helix is the turtle tracks, and on the other side are the footprints of the men, women, and children of the five tribes during the Trail of Tears. The helix blooms at the top into human hands, embracing the turtle, showing strength, survival, endurance, and grace of these fine creatures and our wonderful tribal nations. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I don't. the listeners here, I don't think, are, are familiar with our sacred bones. Joe, do you want to say a little bit about sacred bones? Because that's really what brought... Um, well, how I met Mary Beth was through you and our project. Well, yeah, Sacred Bones was essentially, that was one of the first uh, projects that uh, you and I put together, wasn't it, Gay, whenever you first yeah, it was, it was started, Carulos. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it's been quite a while. Uh, Gay and I used to work together uh, in the U.S. Forest Service. So that's mm -hmm. how we met many years ago. And uh, uh, once we both left the Forest Service, uh, Gay started Carulos, and uh, we talked about something that we wanted to do. And uh, essentially, Gay came up with the Sacred Bones Project, which was uh, a project where we would teach uh, about uh, animals and uh, tribal culture and try and bring them both together and teach students about uh, both uh, wildlife and tribal culture and send them on journeys to uh, trace some of the uh, journeys that the animals take during their lifetime. And uh, sea turtle was uh, one of those that we selected. Unfortunately, I, I don't know, Gay, if, if uh, the sake, uh, the program is still in existence or not. Are we still doing that? Or yeah, or we're just kind of reviving it. What what um, Joe and I worked together, and we really really made a big effort. Like, how do we how do we how do we make this integration? How do we make the dialogue really happening between? you know, the wildlife and tribal people and, and the white communities and um, really bring a kind of a, a catalyst for, for integration. And so we we decided to talk about the sea turtles. Mary Beth, you can keep that up. It's so beautiful. Oh. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. Makes me so. Uh, there's a video that, uh, by the way, on our, on our website, which we'll post, which describes the project. And it's a beautiful video that uh, Mary Beth describes her sea turtle sculpture. So Joe and I came up with this idea of sea turtles because they're global. Um, there's seven species that are identified and each one would be identified with a particular tribal community. So there would be seven pieces of art that would be commissioned. And the first one was with um, Ian George, who is a Maori uh, artist in New Zealand. And he crafted one out of a beautiful stone, which now stands in front of the Ministry of Education uh, in, in New Zealand. Unfortunately, um, Ian passed, but it's an incredible one. And this here with Mary Beth was the idea that this sea turtle, the loggerhead, is associated with the Cherokee and Muscogee, the five quote unquote, five civilized tribes. And we we had where we, we kind of ran aground was we were trying to connect this originally with um, scientific communities. And so we were tried to work with a couple of sea turtle uh, centers, conservation centers, and, and that proved rather difficult. But the idea was is to have these art as really focus of, you know, sort of foci where, you know, the, the tribes and the education program would be developed. And our Sacred Bones workbook that we created, and we're retooling that right now, is that um, 
you know, a family or an individual or a class would, and in fact, actually this did occur in Wisconsin with the wolves. Um, but basically the idea would be that the people would learn about, um, in this case here, the, you know, the five civilized tribes, Cherokee, Muscogee, et cetera. And um, then they would literally and, you know, you know, virtually, if that was not possible, in this particular case, retrace the trail of tears. So starting, you know, starting at its termination as such, and then going back to the origin. And the idea was, is that we actually have from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, from the Washington, D.C. office, we have um, pieces, it's very unfortunate, of sea turtles that were taken in an undercover sting. And so this is very much in parallel, like the repatriation, the rematriation of, um, of, of tribal, um, you know, cultural items and, uh, you know, bodies that were taken to museums. So it's this whole notion of a restoration. I think we called it um, very much like the, this recognition, reparation and restoration. And so the idea of going following, kind of doing the reverse on the Trail of Tears was a sense of, you know, undoing and coming back into a restorative climate, a restorative culture. So this is uh, going to be bronze, right? And so we are going to be seeking funding to have that. And that will be then um, um, installed uh, someplace, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll be where it would be exactly. We originally were going to be doing that at these one of these sea turtle centers, but that proved to be quite difficult politically. We ran into some uh, dead ends is a nice word for it, but perhaps this might be um, uh, located somewhere on the on the uh, Muscogee and Cherokee lands. But it's very very powerful. And Mary Beth, I have to say, I mean, your your design is just so amazing. It's so parallel, the the, the cultures of the sea turtles, the origin story, and the DNA. Um, it's really it really is quite stupendous. So actually that seed. So yes, Joe, it's, it's kind of a second life where, and I, I think it's a better, you know, right now, I think that there's more receptivity in terms of this type of project and the philosophy that it embraces. Did you, either one of you wanted to say anything more about that or? No, I just like, like I was talking to you before you were apologizing to me for it taking so long. And I feel like when it's, if and when it's meant to happen, that's when it'll happen for the place that it's supposed to happen. Yeah, but it's it's to me it like I, it's just sort of um, wonderful. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's sort of like maybe that's the right timing and it's opening up to that. And of course, the sea turtle story, um, just just like the Cherokee Muscogee, uh, the way you described it, Mary Beth. You know, this notion of resilience, the the, the sense of coming home. The stories of sea turtles, I mean, it's so moving. I mean, they they migrate thousands of miles and they've done that for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, very much, you know, like the tribes. One of the things that occurred to me, I was, I was reading this morning and, you know, we, we get fooled by time in this culture. So really, you know, when you're looking at the sea turtles and you're looking at the tribes, I mean, they they basically, we're, this colonized culture is just really a blip. You know, we tend to be sort of absorbed in it, but it really is a blip in the timeline of, of life on this planet. So thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. Well, why don't I, I'll turn this over to Olivia and then we can have our listeners uh, ask questions or make comments. Okay. Yeah, if anybody, thank you so much, Joe and Mary Beth, that's, um, was such an incredible conversation and presentation and the art is so beautiful. Um, and if anyone now has questions uh, for either Joe or Mary Beth, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, or you're also welcome to use the raise hand option um, if you'd like to speak your question as well. Um, but I will monitor the chat. Um, monitor the chat now if anyone has any questions. Yeah, Karen, it looks like your hand is raised. Do you want to um, unmute and go ahead and ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, thank you both for just a really, really inspiring and insightful uh, presentation. Um, I really got so much out of hearing both of you speak. And uh, I, I really, uh, I hope you don't mind 
Joe, I, as being an artist uh, myself, um, and also really uh, working in a variety of different mediums, ceramics and painting and um, mosaics, and really always uh, my my background uh, as a uh, European um, um, from actually Western Western Europe. Um, I was raised with a real deep love for nature and all my artwork has really kind of moved in that direction. And I really wanted to ask um, Mary Beth in terms of, you know, just from my curiosity from being an artist throughout my life and, um, and working in, in communities now um, that are unhoused and who've dealt with a lot of trauma and, um, and um, marginalization and oppression, racism, all the systemic issues that we know of, including, you know, that, that you talked about. Um, my art has really come a lot from the inside uh, and, and has like really been a very healing process over time. It's, it's been really so important for me to like heal various traumas in, in my ancestral lineage. Um, and now working with other communities. I'm just curious if any of that ties into your work or if you could speak at all about what your experience of developing yourself as an artist. I was very inspired by what you said about um, being self-taught and just like, what was it like, you know, moving through that process? I love your work. It's so evocative and, and um, you know, so much from your inside, I feel, and so I just would love if you could speak a little bit from what that's like, um, what, what's that, what that process or journey has been like for you, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, I, I, I have drawn for as long as I can remember. I've always had that creativity in me, you know, always doing something. And that was part of that missing component, I guess, whenever I said that I, you know, didn't feel like I fit in or something. Um, I was always doing something creative growing up, you know, whether it be drawing or, you know, I know at one point I painted ceramics and one point I, I was a florist. Um, and then I decorated cakes and, you know, I mean, I've done just about every creative thing outside of just being an artist that I could imagine. And, and what, what's funny is that when I had my two boys, I've got, I've got two sons. One now is my oldest is 32. My youngest is about to turn 28 next week. Um, gosh. Anyway. So <laughs> When they were little, um, my ex sister in law was at her house, and she was telling me about her new neighbors, and that it was an older couple, and the woman was an artist, and she so she took me over and introduced me to her, and at that point I was not doing anything, nothing, just being a mom and a wife, and you know, I might have been decorating cakes, and so she took me over and met this lady and she did a lot of sculptures and oil paintings, seascapes, things like that. And she was English. And so I asked her, I said, how do you do these sculptures? I've always wanted to learn to sculpt, but didn't have any idea how to get started in it. And she was like, well, okay, I don't normally do this, but I'll send a chunk of this clay home with you. She told me how to keep it moist and kind of how to work it and everything. And she said, and, you know, like, don't make a habit of it, but once you get the piece done and we'll let it dry and then I'll fire it for you so you can see the process. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, cool. You know, so I go home and all I have is one little tool that I had from my ceramics that I used to paint. And I made this, old native man's head, you know, but I couldn't get the eyes. I couldn't figure out how to do the eyes right. So I got her phone number and I called her and I said, is there any way that you could help me figure out how, you know, to do the eyes? And she's like, well, I guess, you know, you can bring it over and, and I'll look at it. And I was like, man, I'm just bugging her. I just felt, oh, so I took it over there. My hair used to be really long. 
had it in a braid and like come down on the side. And she is this little woman. So I go and I knock on her door and, and I'm holding it, you know, in front of me and she opens the door and she looks at it and she looks at me and she looks at it. She grabbed my ponytail and she said, this is your calling. Do you understand it? This is what you're supposed to be doing. And I was like, okay, what, you know? And she said, let me have that. She said, I'm going to take it and I'm going to fire it. And, and she takes it and sets it down. She disappears. She comes back dragging this big bucket of clay. And she said, I want you to take this home with you and you can work at it and sculpt and you can bring it here and I'll fire it until you can get your own kiln. And I was like, I didn't even know what a kiln was. You know, I, it was just all really fast and crazy at the beginning, but she ended up becoming my mentor. And she was also a very, um, I don't know the right word, spiritual type person. And she helped me really open up my mind to doing a lot of meditating and, you know, connecting with, with my thoughts and my dreams and things like that. And so she, she kind of was the one that, that pulled all of that out of me. And she was, I always say she was my kick in the rear end um, that I needed to, to start taking this seriously and taking myself seriously and, you know, I came from um, a marriage of being put down a lot and um, I was always, you know, jumping from one thing to another because it wasn't good enough or, you know, and so I just had such low self-esteem and just felt like I couldn't do anything right. And she changed that for me. She changed my attitude. She changed my perception every day. It was what are you working on today? Let me see it, you know, and, or come over and we'll do this. And just, it, it just changed my life. And from that time forward was, was when I started sculpting, which I haven't sculpted in a little while. I've been focusing more on painting and illustrating, but, but she's the one that, that got me into that. And got me rolling with it. And then her daughter um, is a portrait artist out of Santa Fe. And she was coming to visit one day and she said, um, I want you to come over and show her, you know, some of your drawings. And I was like, no, I'm, you know, I was so intimidated. And so I brought them over to her and she said, these are a good start. And I was like, no, they're finished. And she's like, no, no, no. She said, look, she said, because they were just flat, you know, and they weren't paintings. They were just drawings. And she said, see, you just have to add a little bit of depth here, a little bit of shading here, this here, this here. And it's like a light bulb went off in my head. And it went from seeing like looking at a tree and seeing a brown trunk and green leaves to seeing you know, grays and, and tans and, you know, all these different colors in the bark and then yellows and, and greens, different tones of greens and even, you know, burgundies, things like that in the leaves. So I don't see things in flat colors anymore. I see things in multicolors now. And so that, you know, her and her daughter changed my life. And, you know, once they opened that door and turned that light on, now I I can't imagine not creating because if I didn't have this outlet, I think I would just shrivel up and blow away. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing that beautiful um, description and your experience. Um, it's uh, it it really touches me, and also I find a lot of um, parallel tracks, you know, as far as my own development and kind of being. Um, I'm uncertain about my skills or my abilities, but also being really open to, um, uh, I think the, the love and generosity of, of people who come along in our lives, you know, to, to really mentor us and guide us, which it sounds like, um, you found or attracted or been attracted to. And so anyway, thank you so much for, for sharing that and much, uh, much success. And I did pre-order your book. Um, oh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I knew I, I needed to do it right away. Awesome. And, uh, and I hope, um, and I look forward to future, you know, work and following you and, um, and uh, the development of that project, which you've with you and Gay and 
have been working on for so long is just so, you know, so magnificent. I know it'll come into, it'll be the, it'll, it already is on its way to becoming um, manifested. So the vision is, our, is what takes, what takes you there. So Thank anyway, you. good luck. Thank you. And anybody interested in following us, um, my husband's also an artist, um, but everything that we have is under Moonhawk Art. So Instagram, it's Moonhawk Art. Facebook, it's Moonhawk Art. Our um, website is moonhawkart.com. So it's all, we try to stay consistent with our branding. (laughs) I know with me, and I don't know if this is anything what you're meaning, but um, with my mentor, when she when I told you that she had me do a lot of meditating and things like that. And she would also have me keep a dream journal and a lot of my early works. And I wish I had them. I wish I had the images I could show, but they burnt up in my fire. I, I had a fire back in 2008 and I lost everything like my personal and my business, everything. But, um, but I had these drawings that, that came straight out of just me. I mean, just out of dreams and out of meditations and they, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe them, but they were very different than what I do now. Very, very different, but they were more from just inside of me instead of outside things that I'm, you know, painting, but, but yeah. And sometimes I, I guess I need to get back to some of that too. I was actually talking to John about working on when I have time and then I laughed (laughs) in your free time. (laughs) Yeah. Working on some, some pieces like that, going back to that, but I don't know if that's what kind of what you were. Well, I just got this image, you know, and again, I was listening to, I was, I actually got the audio book because I want is West Studi who's reading it, but I like sometimes just to hear, not necessarily read. And um, it just really struck me. I mean, I guess I'm just talking about me. It's almost this, this, what Vine was describing is that, you know, we tend to be object oriented, but it was really looking at this, this quote unquote, invisible spiritual web in which the quote unquote objects like humans and animals and things like that are embedded. You know what I mean? So um That was just, that really struck me. It was the way he was phrasing it, that in a sense, it was like this, I don't know, just kind of shifted perception about looking into what we would call the invisible or the intangible. Joe, does that make sense or should I keep the day job? I think, (laughs) well, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're pretty much right on there. Growing up, I, uh, my parents used to tell me uh, a lot of stories about uh, what, what we would call today supernatural. But you know, back then, it wasn't supernatural to them. It was, it was normal. And it was about uh, the entire uh, wildlife kingdom and humans and how they both were, were so connected that you just couldn't uh, separate the two. Uh, they were all everything was connected to nature and uh, it was just something that was embedded in their their uh, in their mind and uh, you couldn't see it but uh, you knew it so I think probably that's uh, what Vine was talking about I, I'm not really sure uh I did want to say one thing, though, since you mentioned Vine, I read uh, I read a statement recently that uh, someone had had asked Vine a question, and the question was, "What did uh, what did the American Indians call the North American continent before it became the United States?" And he looked at him and said. We called it ours. So that's, yeah. how Vine, that's how Vine's <laughs> mind worked. You know, he he thought differently than the, from the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. I was listening to some uh, 
like I said, I was listening to some lectures of his and um, and I was fortunate enough to actually have met him and we corresponded for 10 years and he always had that, um, he called it Indian humor, but he always had that little, mm-hmm. you know, changed, completely changed the perspective. You, do you know what I mean? And often it, you know, it was made people uncomfortable, right? You know, <laughs> but it was great. Yeah. And Charlie Hill, I was listening to Charlie Hill. He was, has that same kind of changing perspective type of thing. And a lot of those things, like what you were talking about, if if you talk about them outside the Native community, people think you're crazy. Like what? It's another example. Just like seeing things, feeling things, thinking about things that, that they can't see or that aren't tangible to them, then then it's all like what would be an example oh I don't know um I don't know why this this keeps popping in my head but like my son my youngest son we were driving down um an old highway east of of Guthrie one time and and it was just all woods and hills and pastures and things you know And he was just really deep in thought looking out the window. And he said, you know, people used to live here a long time ago, mom. And one of these days, it's going to be all buildings. And he was telling me all these things that he said he was seeing, you know, that and he was telling me what all it was going to be and everything. And, you know, to me, it was it, it was fine. I mean, I, I believed, you know, that he saw that and, you know, but if he would have told somebody else that, you know, outside the family or whatever, then they would have been like, "Mm, okay, this kid's weird. (laughs) You know, it's just something like that. that, Mm -hmm. I've always had, I felt a connection with birds and especially I don't know why, but red-tailed hawks and people said, oh, that's because you have so many of them there where you live, you know, because I said, I see them all the time, all the time. And they're like, that's because you're in Oklahoma, Northeastern Oklahoma, there's tons of them. Okay. So even when I travel outside of Oklahoma, I see them all the time, you know, and to me, they're almost like guardian angel type thing, you know, and I know one, one time and this, yeah, this is not something I tell a lot of people, but, <laughs> but one time I, I was pregnant, um, before, um, I had Brody, my youngest, I was pregnant and I started having really bad cramps and, and bleeding and everything. And, So, um, my doctor told me to come down. So my husband at that time was driving. And so I'm just sitting there and I'm so worried, so scared. And so I'm looking for a hawk, you know, to make me feel better. Cause like I said, that was my like guardian angel type thing. Make me feel better, positive, something positive. And so I see way ahead and I'm thinking, okay, focus on that hawk, focus on that hawk. And so we get up to it and it was a crow and I just had the most horrible feeling after that and then found out that I had had a miscarriage. And so after that, to me, crows were like bad energy for me, (laughs) everything bad. So I had um, hawks on on the good side and crows on the bad side. And I've had such weird things happen with them too, because there was one, one morning I was driving Fort Gibson um, by their casino, that one road that has the little bridge, you know, you have to go over. So there's like a creek that runs under it early in the morning. So I'm going slow, you know, about 25 miles an hour, come across and a red tail hawk comes from out. I guess he was over the creek, you know, eating uh-huh. or whatever. And he comes out over and the tip of his wing brushed my windshield Wow. scared me to death. I thought, you know, I was going to hit him, but it just barely brushed and went on. And then um, John and I were going to Tulsa on um, the interstate and one came up from the side and we almost hit it. It barely raised up enough and it just flew right over the hood of our truck. And 
Then I, there was another time that I was driving um, west of Guthrie and I was coming around a curb and I did hit one. It um, it hit the mirror on the passenger side. So how many people have that story that they've come so close to, you know, having these hawks right yeah. there in their faces like that? But that where, where the name of, of my business before John and I got together, it's always been Moonhawk Art. So, you know, so that's the hawk part of it and the moon part of it. And I don't remember to this day who said it, but somebody was telling me one time, because so, I've had this affinity for the moon too. I, I'm always, you know, moon gazing. And uh -huh. they said that that you're kind of like the moon, you know, you're all bright and shiny on, on the front part, but then <laughs> deep down or in the background, you've got yeah. kind of this deep, dark <laughs> side of you too. And I was like, okay, well, you know, yeah. and I have all my life dealt with like depression and and mm -hmm. things like that. And so I said, yeah, I guess it's kind of true. You know, everybody sees that, that bright, shiny part, but not everybody sees that dark part in the back. So, yeah. so that's where Moonhawk art came okay. from. I love it. Well, y'all are, are one of very few that knows that. So, Joe, thank you so much for the history lesson as well. Um, Joe worked for many years with over 200 tribal colleges, right? So he's got a he's got access to a lot of a lot of the other tribal um, connections and cultures and history and everything. So, would the BIA have any connection with the? The Bureau, what about the Blackfoot? What about contacting the Blackfoot Nation? Well, the the best if you're looking for information on a person that belongs to a particular tribe, you can go to that particular tribe, and they have all of the records. For instance, uh, like Mary Mary Beth would want to go to the Cherokee Nation uh -huh. because they have all of the ancestral records of all of the tribal members. The BIA used to keep them, but they've turned them all over to the tribes, yeah. the individual oh. tribes. Oh. So if I wanted, if I wanted to uh, trace my ancestors, I would go to the Muscogee Creek Nation. They have all of those records. How would they do it? Would they need DNA or something? Uh, they do it, they do it by bloodline. Uh, so blood by blood right you're, you're, by family not by dna right by family dna is um, not she's going adopted to she doesn't she was adopted by some caucasian couple she doesn't know that and she won't know <laughs> i yeah i've run into many cases like that where people uh are adopted and uh, it's almost impossible to trace trace them unless they can go through the adoption agency and get somehow get the um, record opened oh yeah because you base i mean like with me my um my mom did not have her tribal registration or cdib or anything like that so whenever i went to get mine i had to get birth certificates and death certificates um, to trace me back to the last person that was on the Dawes roll, which is what we have to go by. And mm -hmm. so it's really hard for some people because so far back, some don't have death certificates or birth certificates. Yeah. So it's really difficult for some, but fortunately for Cherokee, they kept such great records, you know, census and everything, and they probably did with Muscogee Creek as well, um, that it's it's pretty impossible to, if you are Cherokee, it's, it, it's impossible for, or not, I should say, I should go the opposite. It's easy to find out. Um, there's a lot of people, and I don't know why they've picked Cherokee, but there's a lot of people that claim that they're Cherokee, but their family just didn't sign on the roll, which it doesn't matter if their father didn't sign or their mother didn't sign. But if they had a direct family member that did sign, then it can be traced somehow so if you are Cherokee really truly Cherokee they can figure it out somehow 
but there's so many people that just, they've been told that by family members, but it's not necessarily true, right? It's more a word of mouth. Yeah, because, and like people say, my grandmother was a Cherokee princess or something. There was no such thing as a Cherokee princess. So it's just family stories a lot of times. And it's, it's sad for people that have grown up hearing things like that. And then it's not true. And they'll fight you to the death about it. Too. <laughs> but that's what their grandma said. So it had to be true. <laughs> so. Yeah, princess, Cherokee princess didn't come out until I think the strawberry, <laughs> the the, um, <laughs> the strawberry festival started, and they started doing them. <laughs> we had we had our wonderful grandma Aggie here. She was from the Sluts River tribe in northern Oregon, mm-hmm. and uh, she for years talked talked about the water, and. Um, I'm so glad I got to see her and hug her before she passed. She was, everybody absolutely loved and worshipped her. Mm-hmm. And there's a beautiful statue in North Ashland in honor of her called the Warrior. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's about 30 feet high, 25. Wow. It's wood carved. Of a, it's a, called <laughs> the Warrior, the Warrior. It was wood carved and another artist here did about 25 bronze castings and copied the wooden statue. The wooden carving is now in the library at Southern Oregon University and the bronze statue is out there in the weather. Wow. So there's there's two, okay. two honoring. Agnes Pilgrim Baker, she had, I think, five kids and she was a lumber truck driver. She was tough. We have wow. big salmon, big salmon uh, festivals at the Road River, and she'd run, a, she'd be driven around in a golf cart with a bullhorn, ordering everybody around. <laughs> awesome. She was incredible. <laughs> well, our sea turtle statue is going to be thirty-five feet, right, Mary Beth? Wow, It'll be as big as you want it. <laughs> <laughs> Where will it be? Where will it be? I don't know. We'll have to figure that out. Well, Mary Beth and Joe and I will get together. Maybe you guys have some ideas on that, but. Um, The last place that we talked about sounded good, wasn't it? In Florida, of course, it might. That's where where the that's where the difficulties came in. Is at the time, um, there the the cities that they were going, (laughs) the city councils that were associated were uh, reticent to to agree to that. So uh, we can talk about that. But I know I should let you guys go uh, because it's been such a long day for you. It's late. You haven't had lunch. No. Well, I wanted to say I I love, you know, I know everybody that's been in this today are animal enthusiasts, animal lovers. And I've loved seeing Nina's snuggly dog. And I haven't seen Ruth's cat, just its tail. And it's so (laughs) funny. You just see that tail going across the screen. (laughs) His name is Grayson. (laughs) I love it. Smokey show up on the screen. (laughs) Yeah, he's he was. Yeah. He's, a, he's half Alaskan husky. Oh, that's cool. He's like Bruce, a small husky. I he's my grandson's dog. That he comes oh, to visit okay. for weeks at a time. <laughs> I had to lock my two in the house. They'd be going in and out of here and barking and carrying on. So <laughs> I've got two little terriers. They're, they're terrierists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate you both and everyone who attended. That was great. We'll be um, making this, all, the it'll be processed, <laughs> the living, the, the interview, and then um, put it on our website. And then I'll send you both the YouTubes. Yeah. Um, we'll make a YouTube so you can share that. Awesome. So well, thank you. Can you send the YouTube to any of, uh, of us? Yeah. Also? Yeah. I'd like to send it to my sister who did all the ink drawings. I, was, I sent you a bunch of her ink drawings. I know she'd love to see Mary Beth's artwork. Yeah, awesome. yeah we will definitely make it available to everyone after um, after it's ready and let you all know let you all know when it's up. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you so much, Mary Beth and Joe, for joining us. It was so amazing to have you both on and such a fabulous conversation. I I learned, I know I learned so much and it's been so insightful and impactful. Um, So thank you very much. Um, And next week we will have 
uh, Gay herself in conversation with Hadassah de Jack Reynolds, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Tikkun Olam Farm Sanctuary. Um, oh. And yeah, like I said, in about a week, um, so November 13th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, um, and they'll be discussing sanctuary, the seeds of animal reparation, and sovereignty. Um, but yeah, Mary Beth, Joe, thank you so much, and thank you to our audience and Gay for all of the questions. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys next week, and thank you so much for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. It was fun. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye, Joe. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.